Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the Royal Academy. We're delighted to be um, hosting this event, a kind of short, intense conference, Alberto Burri, A Radical Legacy. And we're delighted that Tawana Bani Art have sponsored it generously and brought together three great panellists, uh, plus me. Um, the, I remember about 15, 20 years ago, um, I'm not telling one of those stories where I want you really to know who I'm talking about, generally not. It, it's more the... Um, the, the ignorance that I want to foreground. But I remember at an opening um, in London, mentioning the name of Alberto Burri. This is, this, is this is the president of the Burri Foundation, so only he's allowed to have a phone going off. <laughs> <coughs> no one else. Anyway, switch it. Um, I remember mentioning the name of Alberto Burri uh, to two uh, then distinguished curators um, in British institutions, both of whom have gone on to be directors of pretty distinguished institutions, and just so that there's no question, um, point of the fingers, not Tate. Um, and they just had no idea who I was talking about. I mean, it may have been my pronunciation, but I remember articulating again and again. But, and, and they just, it wasn't on the register. And I think it's not just a sort of blinkered view that you could ascribe to certain parts of the British art world. Uh, I think it's also the fact that Bury really does deserve to be better known, and certainly in this country is nowhere near as well known as he ought to be. And I think things are changing. I think the big exhibition at the Guggenheim in 2015, initially in America, did quite a lot to, 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 um, to do that. But I think um, one of the things we might tease out today is about that reputation why it deserves to be better known, why, it, some, why he sometimes hasn't been better known. Um, but I'm delighted to say that this summer in Venice, um, Bruno Cora, the president of the, of, of the uh, Burri Foundation, will be curating an exhibition at the Cini Foundation, whose director, who's also the associate curator of the Gu Peggy Guggenheim collection, um, Luca Massimo uh, Barberi, is here. And that show will look at Buri in ways we're going to articulate and tease out in a minute. And I'm also delighted to be able to announce that at some stage in the next three years or so, um, the Pompidou Centre will do a Buri exhibition. And I'm also delighted to welcome uh, Bernard Blistain, one of the most important distinguished museum directors in Europe from the Pompidou Centre, um, who's going to be responsible for that exhibition. So things are changing, but it may just be a very British view that... Um, uh, that he wasn't a frontline artist from the beginning. So before we tease out various aspects of this long, distinguished and interesting career, and I also, this isn't a plug for the sponsors, it's actually being able to give you the opportunity of seeing work. There is work by Buri as well as Fontana at Tuona Bunny at the moment. I'm going to ask um, Bruno Caro to, to talk a little about uh, who Buri was, to do a little introduction. So over to, over to you. Bruno. Okay. Uh, Good evening and welcome. I want to project some slides about uh, Burri. Alberto Burri was born in uh, Città di Castello on 12 uh, March 1915. And before his death, he set up the Foundation Burri in the 15th century, Palazzo Albizzini, in his hometown. After the Second World War, part of which he spent in a prisoner of camp war in Hereford, Texas, he abandoned medicine and dedicated himself to making art. Completely self-taught, he began to experiment with abstraction using different materials as early as 1948. Like in SZ1, this work of 1949, he started to make art using youth sacks that once carried ration, such as sugar, flour, etc., that were part of the United States Marshall Aid Plan intended to help rebuild Europe after the war. This is the first sacco, 50, which contains almost no paint at all. This is a Grande Bianco made by Sacco also in 52 that Robert Rauschenberg have seen in uh, the studio of uh, Alberto Burri in Rome in 53. At this time, uh, 
Rauschenberg was preparing his own show boxes and fetishes at the Galleria dell'Obelisco, and he asked to visit the Buri studio. Uh, the following year, in 54, Rauschenberg start, started to making his new famous combined painting before he made boxes and fetishes, different work. In the 52, uh, Burri started to work also in the shape canvas like that. Sacco in 53, that is one of the masterpieces from the permanent collection of the Fondazione Burri. This is a combustion uh, in uh, wood in uh, 57, but he started to work in uh, 53. He works also with clothes for make uh, monochrome, monochrome works in 57. After he works with the wood and wood, barnet wood. And after two uh, metal, metal sheets soldered and together with the soldering frame, 1960, uh, yes. Uh, in 61, he started to work with the plastic, transparent plastic, and make an exhibition in the Marlboro Gallery in Rome, 62. Uh, he used the transparency of the material. After he made it in red, and after also in black in different years. This work was made in 64, 65, the, the, the period it was uh, two years, and was exhibited in uh, uh, Venice Biennale. He used also uh, acrovinyl, acrovinyl, it means uh, vinavil uh, and, uh, uh, and caolino, caolino, yes, for make uh, cretti. For this work, uh, the, the most important was to control uh, the in preview. And uh, finally, he arrived in the 60s uh, to work uh, uh, cello text. The cello text was a, a wood composite used for isolation, insulation. Uh, Buri used this material as a base for his work since the 50s. But in the, in the beginning, it was only for support, and after, like a poetical material. He would also assemble standard cello text in different size, modules to make acrylic paintings. Burri, in front of his studio, you, you can see the small man, like in the Piranesi engraving. Uh, during the 90s, uh, from the photo of uh, Gabriele Basilico. These are the, inside the Seccatoi del Tabacco in Città di Castello, in which we can uh, admire 18 works uh, that was uh, exhibited the first time in uh, Mulino Stucchi in Venice in 82, to, uh, during the Biennale. This is a cycle black on black. Uh, the, the title is Non ama il nero. It means uh, he dance, dance like uh, black. It's a contradictory notably. This was one of, one of the last uh, cycle. Is uh, of the tw uh, 92 before his death, and is gold and black. We have also some uh, sculpture uh, out of the big uh, museum that you see in the font of the, of the image. And there were three sculptures. The left sculpture that you see, like a red uh, circle, is uh, made in, uh, uh, during the Documenta 7. So we have the complete. Uh, view of the 11 big uh, stores of the museum in uh, Città di Castello and the, the Paysage. Thank you. So let's briefly explore where Bury comes from. I don't, I don't just mean geographically. I thought it was brilliant, by the way, um, Bruno, that you managed just to get in that he clearly influenced Robert Rauschenberg, but you just dropped it in in terms of, of timing. But 
No, he's self-taught. He's a medical student. The doctor painter is one of the nicknames. He's captured in, I think, North Africa, but as you said, was, was um, imprisoned over in Texas, in, in Hereford. Um, and it's often said that his approach to materials comes directly from the experience of the hospitals, the bandaging, and the burlap that divided the latrines in a prisoner of war camp. Is it too dangerous, reductively, to see him, his, his obsession with materials, coming so close to his own experience? Or do, is, that, is that a view you would agree with? What I can see, what I can tell uh, to you is that Burri uh, was very against uh, all the interpretation of his uh, works. So uh, for, for to, to go near to his work, I think it's important to uh, remain in front of the painting like uh, an absolute uh, presence, material, and it's not possible um, to have uh, some, uh, what you mean, uh, metaphor about, yeah, yeah. Yes, about the work. Is without any metaphor, Burri. So I think it's very interesting to the form, to the space. It's very interesting to the equilibrium. Is uh, some painter that uh, he likes very much the control of Indian preview uh, because uh, he works with some materials with the fire. The fire is difficult to to spend the fire, to finish the fire during the work. So he took with the, by hand. Uh, sometimes also very dangerous. Um, in all the way, I think that uh, Buri is a very easy painting, painter. He's not a complicated painter. He's not a mysterious painting, painter. He's uh, some people that uh, uh, like poetry very much, and he wants to be a poet of a material. That's I will, what I understand of Buri. One of the roles of, a, of curators, of course, though, um, Bernard, is to, is to give new contexts, is to give new um, narratives, new ways of, of looking and seeing. Will you be exploring the materiality fundamentally of Burry, or will you be looking at, at different contexts? That the, that w will you look at metaphor, for example? Will you go head to head with Bruno's view of Burry? No, uh, I respect what. Uh, Bruno says when he explained that Bury wanted no interpretation. But isn't it our role, you know, as museum curator, to try to give an interpretation? And to me, the first one which comes to my mind is, as you said, the fact that he was a doctor. I don't want to be too Freudian and even ridiculous. But it seems to me that there is a strong link between the fact that he was a doctor. When you see the surfaces of what he does, I don't want to say that he, he, he tries to repair something. But if you look back to the post-war and to, I guess, the art scene as his own life, you know, and the post-war, it seems to me that you cannot separate when you try to get inside, you know, the work. Uh, what he did as a doctor, the war, the post-war, and something which, in fact, cannot be repaired. Because when you look at the surface, and when you look at what he does, you know, it seems to me that we need definitely to try to, to, to understand the meaning of, of the works and the process from the early works, let's say, till, well, the mid-50s, as something which is deeply inside the history of European culture of the post-war, which we cannot compare with American art. I do agree when you say that Rauschenberg went to the studio. But the more I look to Bury, the more I see the distinction with Rauschenberg. Rauschenberg, who is dealing with images. Rauschenberg, who is dealing with a post-Dada collage. And it seems to me that if you look back you know, to the early works uh, of Bury, that it goes 
directly from the very beginning in another direction. So let's say that it is, it's a first step, you know, which I would love to consider to get inside, you know, the process of what he does. Yeah, exactly with Bernard. It's, it's very important. We have been raised and naturally <coughs> as a generation to compare all European art and dated with the United States art, especially post-war. It's so, uh, uh, no, yeah. That's the, uh, you know, post and anti. So I think that um, what we're discovering now, luckily with new generation, is that we were different. Uh, something was going around after the Second World War, and it was going around Europe. And when you said a, it was a doctor, but also we have to understand that Italy was deeply wounded and destroyed by the war. Um, so when I hear the word trauma about Buri's painting. I, which was the title of the Guggenheim exhibition. Which apparently was the title of the Guggenheim. Uh, uh, I'm actually going a little bit, but I mean, the trauma was, was going on in Italy and Europe after the war. Um, I think he was trying to fix something, but also he was representing um, all different issues about the Italian culture growing up again. So when you think what was going on, and unfortunately we don't have books spread around the world about what was going on in Italy from 1946 to 1949. When you look at that a little bit closer, um, then you discover that it was, a, it was really a birth of a new nation. So I think also Buri is representing both sides. Um, and as at the Tonoboni Gallery, actually now, um, we had these two chevaliers um, fighting with the new way of painting. Um, which is Buri and Fontana. And 1948 and 1949 were both incredible dates about these discovering a new way of painting, which has nothing to deal with what's going on in the United States, as Bernard was mentioning. I think that's a point strongly made by all three of you. I mean, it, it is worth saying, aside from the fact he spent time in America, but it is a moot point as to whether being in a prisoner of war camp anywhere opens you up to the culture. He also married an American later, didn't he? She, she was a dancer. Yes, indeed. But I, I, I do think that we could say gen generally there's something that it's a, there is a distinction between European and, and American uh, culture. But what is it? What about the specifically Italian aspect of Bury's art as it emerged? I mean, connections it with the old masters for certain. We can look at that. But w what defines it in its in its Italianness then? It, Italian is a is a very weird language. It's the only country we, you know that speaks Italian is Italy. So I don't think. Um, it's a, it's a very complex language. Uh, what I think, and as we were like briefly saying before with Bernard Mestet uh, and Bruno, um, the fact is that um, you never forget what your eyes have been seeing, even if you're a doctor. The interesting point about Buri, that it was a self-thought. So you can't say it was an academic or it was like trained as, an act or as, as a painter. So it's interesting because it comes from Umbria and, and then definitely in the center of the heart of Italy. Um, as we have been seeing, you know, 12, 13, 14 centuries. And th that kind of impact, simplicity, but roughness, but richness and metal and gold, and besides the fact we were talking about Piero and whatever. So I think the roots of, of, of his art are the, um, are the materials that a certain kind of art, Italian artists were using back in the centuries. But at the same time, and it's something I want a little bit stress, um, there's a kind of um, less known today, but I mean, it was kind of incredible uh, laboratory in Italy with the futurism. And the futurism had been changing deeply the idea of how to paint, uh, maybe more technically through the manifestos. But I mean, the new generation of the Second World War, they were looking at that kind of energy without the political matters, um, of saying like, okay, let's rebuild the world. And I think that's very Italian, that kind of energy of rebuilding the world uh, through um, inventing new ways. I think that's more than um, the history. Um, it's true, we do have history. All European states have histories. Uh, but I think the strength of Buri and some other Italian painter was like um, we're restarting a new tradition. 
which I think is very interesting, than just look in the past. And that's another point, which I think is very important. Now we're talking about Bodhi as a master, but we have to understand that, you know, 75% of the official art critic were against this new generation um, artist. Um, he has been suited, um, Palma Bucarelli was suited because she was buying a Buri painting. Um, Giulio Andreotti, the well-known Italian political, was stressing them into the parliament because Buri and Fontana were not artists trying to force the parliament go against, and we're talking about 1958, we're not talking about you know, 1912. Um, so um, I think that situation, the strength of his work, really uh, makes him uh, a poet, which makes him Italian. Can I just deal with the political issue? Because you mentioned politics. And um, uh, Burry was, as many people were, was supportive of Mussolini, fought uh, in, in uh, the colonial expansion wars. Um, is there a sense of, I mean, you talk about the rebirth of a nation. Is there a sense that in not dealing with figuration or explicit content, but, 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 but working as a material poet, as Bruno rather beautifully put it, um, that there's a sense of pushing politics to one side, that, it, 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 that there's a, not, not a retreat into art, but that, that it, it was an avoidance of, of that, or it was a negation of that? Good question. Um, Complex. Well, eventually, Italy was fascist for 20 years. Uh, and a lot of people was living in Italy under a dictatorship that was called fascism. Uh, most of the young kids were fighting and were, you know, you can't, you know, leave the state. Um, there's a very, very delicate issue about fascism and art. Uh, all of them, I mean, he was very young, he was 1915, so, I mean, he wasn't that mature. Mm. Uh, but, and he was an artist during that time. But um, I think there's still, um, it's a very less known movement, but in the 30s, especially in Milan, we have the, Nash, I mean, the Italian abstractions, which was incredible, completely unknown today. But it was doing something no figurative, almost geometric, and I'm talking about the works of Fontana, uh, and, and the works of Melotti, the works of um, architects. Um, so we always had, through always through futurism, a certain kind of hidden, floating movement about towards abstraction. Then you had the, the you know figurative representations. So um, I think that the post-war art goes towards abstractions to find the new space. We know metaphors, we know political intents. But the biggest fight after 1948 was, to, was between figurative and non-figurative artists. And it wasn't the right wing of the parliament going against the non-figurative, was the Communist Party. Mm. So it's very complicated when Togliatti says, um, if you wanna be a communist, you have to paint figurative. So um, I think that everything was not representing something, always f you know, went very, was very radical and was very provocative during the fascism and during the Republic. So if you read the letters um, of the Italian critics, everybody was going towards figurative because it had to be uh, more Republican, more new. Um, now we're talking about Buri, Fontana, and all these, and Afro, and all these incredible masters. But we, as Italians, have to remember that we have been leading as a painter for almost 40 years by Renato Guttuso. So um, we shouldn't forget that. And till the 80s. So what I'm, what I'm trying to um, make um, as, a, as a kind of a statement is now we're celebrating <clears throat> great masters, but they were never conceived as a great master, but always as revolutionaries. Um, and the fortune of Buri eventually was in the United States before Italy. Yes, I, uh, I am in the same uh, conviction that uh, Luca Massimo, but uh, I think that in uh, in, uh, in the Italian art, there, there was always two 
different line. For example, when we start from the beginning of the century, we have futurists like Boccioni, so materials, etc. But we have also uh, metaphysical people like De Chirico, yeah. are two different lines, like uh, Fontana and Burri after. So it's two, uh, two lines that uh, you can find always during the century in Italian art, I think. And uh, in another way, I think that uh, after the war, Burri, when come back in Italy, after three years of uh, uh, concentration camp, uh, was prisoner, he uh, discovered that the, the country is completely changed, the destruction, uh, uh, ruins, uh, unbelievable. So uh, I think that uh, he understand that uh, it's necessary to consider a new, new life completely. So left uh, to be medical people, no? Left, uh, start to, to become a painter. And in Rome, huh, was a good climate for um, intellectual group. For example, um, near to Colla sculpture, there was Capogrossi, there was uh, some friends like Emilio Villa, poet, uh, but also Corrado Cagli, painter that no, no, was so, so, so no, well known, but it's very important also for to understand Burri because uh, uh, in this moment uh, the poetic was the, prima, the pr pr primordio. Primordio it means uh, the beginning of the, the culture in the in the history of art. So they uh, work together to discuss, etc. In this moment, make an exhibition that is uh, origine in fifty. It begins the, the origin of the world, the origin of the material. The group uh, uh, was uh, for only one night because the day after they destroyed the group. But uh, it's a very, very big discussion in this moment in Rome. Rome was uh, one center very active for American people, for England people, for many artists that comes, and not only in the painter, but also in the cinema, literature. So in this moment, uh, I think Burri, that was a man, educated man, uh, is a completely, um, is not academic people that study art, but is men that know very well the culture. So he, he started from zero. After, yes, from zero, zero, uh, completely, no? Yeah, uh, that, I mean, one of the, the ways that his career is explored, and it seems inevitable that one can't escape it, and maybe one doesn't want to anyway, is through these series of works. That he, you know, yes. He's a serial artist. They overlap, but they're serial. In your knowledge of him, was each series almost starting again, or was it evolving? Did he, did he no, see it evolving, or it was, lui, everything was ground zero? When I'm stufo, I change my work. When I'm bored, I'll change jobs. Finish. Yeah. <laughs> he speak. When you ask me why you change, uh, because I am tired, I, I yeah. change, stop, yeah. finito. It's not uh, some people that want to go like uh, Capogrossi for many years or some, some other. He change completely, always. Bernard, how is the, how is the, the, um, the, this sense of you know, an evolving serial artist, how is that curatorial? On one level, it's clearly a gift. That's the way you can explore him. But is it something you feel you want to try and break out of, or will you, is, are your initial thoughts about the way you're going to make your exhibition, it will be series by series, there'll be spaces filled with each series? I don't know yet. I like to, to come back to something we've said before, which is a bit provocative. You can be a fascist and a great artist. If you follow the history of art, only in Italy, but in different places, you find quite a lot of great artists who, at the beginning, were, let's say, part of the avant-garde and who moved inside what we call fascism. To me, the most important is definitely with such an artist as Bourri to consider what he did inside the context of this post-war and specifically about the context of Italy. On one side, you have, well, let's say, the utopia of such an artist as Fontana, 
the new world and anyway, the great expectation and all the manifestes and whatever. Uh, the world has to change or anyway to, to become new. On the other side, that's why I feel, uh, you have such an artist as Bourri who tried, as I said before, you know, to repair the world on the trauma of what we call les décombres, the décombres, you know, of the world. It gives definitely two different directions. On one side, an artist who is a believer, and another side, another one, you know, who tries to develop something as, in one way, a political statement, which is quite different than this great UTP, which you find inside abstraction. It's important what you said before, the fight and the post-war was all over the world between abstraction, which one, in a way, if you look back at the history of art in the post-war, everywhere, and figurative painters. But most of the artists who were involved uh, with abstract art, you know, were like great utopists a new word, a new definition of the word, the power of ar architecture, the abstract. Can we say that when you look at the paintings, at, at the works, can I say painting, by Bourri, that they are abstract? Do they work with something else? Materiality, organism, whatever, I don't know. So do we say that such an artist is constructing or deconstructing, because it's always both inside what he does, a new paradigm. To me, you need, when you look at an artist as Bourri, to redefine the vocabulary, which usually you use to qualify, you know, one specific context. And this is where I would love to try to define, you know, uh, as we said at the beginning, uh, the, for example, the, the relation, the connection between Bourri and all masters. I was talking with my friend, you know, Michele Casamonti, when we arrived in London, and he said to me, I would like to, to put an old master in front, one of uh, the paintings of Bourri. And finally, I had in mind that it would be perfect to try to put the late Tiziano, the torture of Marcias, you know, in front of a painting by Bourri. Because the torture of Marcias, which is one of the greatest paintings of the world, you know, is definitely the dilemma between la bellezza, as we say, Apollo, you know, and uh, Oh, no, horror and another side. And to me, there is something in Bourri which I would like to explore. Look, this painting, you know, has been influenced by Piero della Francesca, you know, specifically this painting. When we opened the centenary of Bourri, the first yes. exhibition that we do yes. was in San Sepolcro <coughs> in, front to the, in front of the resu Resurrection mm -hmm. by Piero della Francesca, three works by Bourri. Mm -hmm. was the connection. Uh, but on another side, despite of the fact that I don't think that you've been talking with him about that, you know, Apollo and Marcias should be for me as the dilemma between beauty and horror, definitely something which can help to light, you know, breweries. Uh, and also I think the physical matter of painting in sure. problem in Titian, uh, which goes very close to the problem of matters in painting uh, with Bure, when I think it's something tactile that you feel like is unfinished, uh, but also very problematic. So I think it's a kind of a idea of really touching 
the materials. I, mean, I think, I think the notion of flaying is quite an interesting yeah. one formally in, in terms of his approach to material. But did, Bruno, so now did, Michele did is up about to you. Did he talk about Titian in an engaged way? I mean, we know about Piero. Yes. Uh, and I suppose there isn't an artist who's lived who hasn't thought in some sense about Titian. But did he, he engage with Titian deeply? Yes, he, he talks uh, many times. But uh, was a man uh, that he preferred to talk with the uh, uh, not with the intellectual people. He doesn't Hunters, like yes. to speak with the I never met of art. <laughs> it's uh, very, very difficult to, to open a discussion of uh, aesthetic problem with him. Uh, he prefers to speak of football very much. I'm Which actually I am I'm definitely I'm unable to do. By the way, <laughs> when, but I look, remember, look at the late works, you know, it's important because we talk about beauty, but it's exciting to see how in the last, well, let's say, two decades, he tried to come back to the so-called painting, you know, and to become more a, a painter than he was before. There is as a, as a loop between the very early uh, works, you know, I mean, the, the works from the end of the 40s, and what it did in the last time. And what you see in between is all this process, mm. to me, to repair something, to get the possibility to, to repaint or to paint again. It's a bit, I don't want to go, it's a little bit too intellectual, but anyway, keep in mind what Adorno wrote after the war, you know, uh, the impossibility to paint, as the impossibility to write. What can I do after the war, after the Shoah, after Auschwitz? Mm -hmm. you know? And I feel something like that inside uh, uh, Bury's works, I mean, in the process of what he Are you saying that there's a kind of, you talk about the loop, you know, the, from the 40s to the, to the last, are you saying there's some kind of resolution? What do you mean by but, some kind well, of Well, that having worked through the, 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 the various violent processes, you talk about sort of trying to heal some things unresolved. Do you think that the, 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 la the latter part of his career, it shows in some odd sense, having worked through all of that, that certain things have been resolved for him? I guess that he tried and wanted to be a painter. And there was as a, some kind of impossibility. And it seems to me that the very late works, you know, feel for him, which is more important than for myself, uh, as an, an accomplishment, if you know what I mean. Um, I'm not so sure that the very late paintings are my favorite, because I do know that I like, I like the, the complexity, you know, of the process, you know, and the, the, all the difficulty, you know, to reinvent something after, you know, uh, the, the war. But yes, of course, when you see the late paintings, uh, he, I guess he got something which from the very beginning seems almost impossible. I have uh, the idea that uh, Cellotex was the um, the, at the end of his work, because he, he liked to arrive uh, to this uh, harmony, to this uh, quality of uh, simplicity. And uh, in reality, uh, in this work, you can find uh, equilibrium, <coughs> uh, color again, for many times before the color was only, only the color of the, of the material, catrame, sacco, etc. But he uh, returned to the color, flat color, and uh, it's like uh, uh, the end of the Voyage au bout de la nuit. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. Sure. Is the end? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the French poet. It's yeah, Italian. Yeah, yeah. It's Italian. <laughs> yes. But it's it's North also Italian. Also the Is greatest no, fascist a... French writer. No, is a, is a... <laughs> apparently I heard that. No, no, he's a, 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 well. a right, you know, arrive to one point of serenity. Also himself, quite with himself, and uh, I think is a man that understand all what happened, 
and uh, is a form of harmony also in which uh, he uh, obtained uh, to the end a uh, quiet with himself, the pace with himself, etc. So it's a moment uh, in which Burri, uh, I think, uh, go back to the, uh, to the youngness, to the youngness before the war. Because in, in the youngness, Burri made a small, uh, small tempera, very small, five centimeters that we find in his studio. And uh, many of these tempera, there are uh, in the same way of the cello text. So, is a full circle interesting. A rebour, a rebour. Um, we've mentioned old masters in passing. Which artists, 20th century or otherwise, did he admire and who did he most learn from? Which artists? Yes. I am thinking. For Burri, I think was uh, Miro, for example. For Burri was Ben Nicholson. Some of these artists. He really? Likes. Ben Nicholson? Yes. It's exciting. Here we are. Right? Sounds. It's, it makes sense. The right place. Here, I guess. Some and also Calder, for example, Calder was a big friend of him. Who? Alexander Calder, yes. Oh, yeah. They, they changed the, the work. Mm -hmm. He's the only artist that we change, that he changed his work. Calder gave a mobile, and Buri gave one gobbo. And could you talk a little bit about his relation with Fontana? No, with Fontana, uh, I think they have a secret, <laughs> secret uh, meeting <laughs> sometimes <laughs> mm. in the studio of Fontana. I didn't find because, it. Because uh, when Burri was in the Venice Biennale in 52, Fontana buy one work to the end of the Biennale. It was the first the wo work ever. Yeah. One work by Burri, <coughs> Lo Strappo. Oh, yeah. His work now is in the National Gallery of Scotland, uh, Depot. Mm -hmm. And this uh, was a sign of estimation very big because Buri was very young. Uh, Lo Strappo is like a cat, eh? 52. So. While you were talking, and, and Bruno were talking, or was talking, uh, I thought about. Apollo Marzia again, and, you, and then you were mentioning the cello text. So there's a little video, uh, I think it was a TV series, whatever, on Italian artists. There's a video of Burri, I think in the 80s, and he's showing for the first time ever, and then at a certain point he says, uh, I'm not showing it anymore because they're, go they're gonna copy me. Um, the way he was working with the cello text. So he's actually literally peeling the surface of actually, and, and, was, and that's exactly what happened to, uh, to Marsha. <laughs> yeah. yes, so, and, and that's interesting, the idea of, of this also working on scarification of the, of the surface um, about Buri. So I, it's, it's kind of, um, I don't think he's related with all masters, but he feels the material like all master and he works with the energy of old master. In 1983, if I'm not wrong, uh, he was invited to uh, the Cantieri Navali in the Giudecca in Venice. Yes. And it happened that I was there because my professor sent it me with the architect, looking at Burri installing. Uh, there were abandoned industrial huge spaces uh, on the Giudecca. So um, what I was actually shocked was that the fact that these 12 or seven, 12 painting, I mean, enormous. 18, 17, 18, 18. You've shown 17 in the sculpture. 17 in the sculpture. In the sculpture. 18 works. Um, so the 17 works were hanged up above like five, six meters from the ground. And they looked just one side, like a huge yeah. long line. Um, and then at that point, I've got this, uh, this question and said, why? Um, and I discover through his words, but also through the architect words, and then you can see every single photos of his shows, the attention. I don't, 
I don't believe he wasn't an intellectual. He just wanted to be by himself. <laughs> but I don't believe he was or wasn't. He wasn't. <laughs> I think he was very aware of what, what he was doing and yeah. he was studying and was looking. And since the beginning, even in the history of the Biennale, he was very, completely aware and concentrated on how to present the works, how many works. I mean, he was very, very paying attention how the work had to be shown. Um, and this idea of hanging mm -hmm. this kind of fregio up five meters above my head there, I think it that's the link towards the way people initially look at frescoes in the church. Yes. And when you go to Città di Castello, first of all, you have to go there, which is already a pilgrimage. Um, and then you have these incredible black <coughs> painted industrial spaces. I mean, that's not somebody playing, you know, easily with his work. And then you step into these kind of cathedral-shaped black spaces, and then you understand the mise-en-scene, the installation, the idea he had about his work that's since the that's beginning. Just... So there's nothing casual, there's, even if he was playing with causality. You know, he, he, nothing... worked, he works in this direction after doing an exhibition in uh, Convento Maggiore di San Francesco in Assisi, where there is Giotto. Is, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so when, you a, yeah, when you ask what the relation is, is with Italian culture, is the way you can see ancient cultures, European culture, mm -hmm. the way you can see works in the space. Um, and I think what new generation, and I think also what the Venetian show would be about is to show Buri um, moment by moment, research by research since 1948, 1949, which I think is very important. And, and as Listan was mentioning before, towards the end, maybe we're not ready yet to say is our favorite moment. But I think, as you mentioned but now, um, there's something that gives you um, a kind of another look, another idea of how Buri was moving. But I think it's the right moment now for a new generation, I'm mentioning again new generation, which I believe in a lot, um, finally to find out how he was working and how he reacted to um, the post-war moment, uh, being European, which I think is very important, and be very famous in the United States. Um, I, I actually brought something here just to read, um, and I, do I have, yeah. Um, there's um, another point, which you might not be with me, but um, that only uh, James Johnson Sweeney was mentioned, and Herbert Reed um, mentioning again, uh, were actually pointing and focusing, was this kind of casuality, but also the, the sensuality and the pleasure he was having while working, mm -hmm. which is not a trauma. It's a pleasure, yeah. and also he was, he was, um, and he was really playing with materials. Yeah, the playfulness of, of yeah, the, the play, process. yeah, which I think it's very important. Which is almost which is great, know, as you see an image of him setting fire to a canvas. You know, think is, about somebody working. Well, you know, think about Fontana appears in the canvas in 1948-49, but think about Bure working with Tar in 1948 or. Fire in 1952. Um, I think it's almost, you know, the beginning of an all performative way of working in the art, in, in the art, make a work. Um, and I think it's very interesting the fact that he was discovered and he was stressing a lot, but not yeah. about met metaphors, but about colors, white and black. So it's interesting. Herbert Reed writes on the Observer in 1960 that Buri has discovered the wide evocative range of black, the negation of color. His painting all black is an encrustation of paste, paint, paper. Only the artist could reveal the secrets of his technique, and he has probably forgotten some of the ingredients. Um, I think that it's, it's very interesting because um, we have this self-thought musician chemist, um, not, as you said, not with the same utopia of others, but I mean, it was kind of reusing as, a, um, how do you say, um, 
una, questi che facevano la... Um, there's somebody that was working during the 16th century with revealing the gold and revealing... Alchemist. Alchemist. It's a new kind of alchemy that you're having and, and in this birth of, of a new painting. I remember. And that's very interesting because uh, we're always mentioning his series through almost this, this, the name of the materials are made of. Well, <clears throat> I agree with what you say, but there's another artist we mentioned and it seems to me that it's important to come back, you know, to him is if Klein, if Klein. Yeah. But in if Klein, there is always as a cosmic expectation, which maybe I'm wrong. I never felt inside, you know, uh, Boris' works, and it's to me again a quite important distinction between the process of Bury's works and the other artists we mentioned before. And something else, once again, we were talking about the late painting. And the late paintings look more painterly in a way than what he did before. And I tried, you know, once again, it's just about an interpretation, which definitely is, well, uh, my own research. Mm. It seems to me that he, when he went back to painting, it reminds me, you know, this fantastic sentence by Arthur Rimbaud. Um, she's found what? Eternity. And it seems to me that when he went back to painting, there's something like trying to catch again the eternity of painting, which in the last decades before, he couldn't raise. He said that painting was a freedom attained, is an English translation, sure. which may be similar so to far. the point you're making, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eternity of painting. Very interesting the connection with Arthur Rimbaud because uh, uh, a good Burry, artist. Burry, yes, read. I see his bibliotheque. My uh -huh. bibliotheque. He read Rimbaud. He read uh, Ungaretti, mm -hmm. Italian, yes. He read uh, uh, Joyce and uh, Eliot, Wasteland, for example. He read many, many poets. Ezra Pound uh, also, of course. normally. But I mean, after so many fights, you know, Rimbaud is 20 years old, 20 years old, could you imagine? <laughs> Which is crazy. And he wrote, she's found what? Eternity. Which is spiritual, but not religious. Let's, um, in the time we have left, let's cover two things. The first is, you've alluded to his articulation of space, not just the equilibrium that uh, Bruno talked about in the paintings, but the way that he hung his work. And so there's a kind of, I suppose, an architectural sensibility there. It, 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 what's the connection, or is there a, any meaningful connection between the works themselves and the, the, the spatial ways that he hangs them? Or is it it, are, are these detached elements? And he had an architectural sensibility when he hung his work, but it didn't inform the painting. I, I, uh, it's not easy to, I'm mesmerized by these works going on the screen yeah, that way. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Especially this one, though, uh, Gothic. Uh, I've been going through some letters and documents about the Biennale um, and, his, and his letters too. So you find out that he's stressing uh, the commission of the Biennale. He's actually very young. Um, and, and he's expressing <coughs> the commission of Biennale saying, I don't want you to choose more than three works. Um, and, and he was actually sending three works, which they're going to be, luckily, at the Venice show this summer, um, 
conceived by the same size with different colors and different materials, two meters and a half, a meter and 80. So he was deciding already, you know, the Biennale was very chaotic, um, tons of artists. So sometimes in 1948, there were like 358 Italian artists. Um, so, and then little by little, they were getting a little bit, you know, a little bit short lists. Um, and he was saying, I'm coming and I would give you these three paintings, but I'm just upsetting the fact that you're taking the three of them and you install them. So I think Vuri was one of the most um, knowledge artists of how to use the space to hang the works. Uh, even if it wasn't stressing about the space in the Fontana, in the Fontana way. I think one of the things I was driving at, but not very eloquently, was the shifts in scale. But there's, they're very defined the scale of his work, but they also hint at a kind of potentially cosmic scale and a, a, and a microscopic scale. And one of his greatest works for me is that extraordinary monument at Ghibellina in Sicily, was where mentioned. from the distance <laughs> it look, reads like a sort of Creto painting yeah. or construction, and close up it's an immersive monument that actually deals with the footprint of a, of a town that was destroyed in an earthquake. And that shift in scale seems to me a wonderful kind of uh, um, example of an artist who understands material, but also who architecturally can deal with form and space. Well, the, the fact that he was actually filling and building and constructing and given this equilibrium, as yeah. Bruno was saying before to the painting, of course, uh, then you can talk, even if he didn't like it, you can talk about con uh, actually the composition of the work and the way he was conceiving the materials, but also the way he was Building the works is incredible and is perfect, even if a lot of chance was happening. There's another point um, that you actually hardly see from these lights, um, the plastic. Um, some of them, they're actually using the viewer to exist because you can see through and they actually include in the space while hanging in the emptiness. So you can see through from both sides. That's something, again, very important. Going back to Jubilina, I think it, that's a pilgrimage that everybody has to do once in life, driving all the way there, in the, especially in the, in the summer, July, very yeah. warm summer. Um, and then you understand exactly what Bernard Distin was saying, not religious, but because you know that there's a destroyed village underneath that. Uh, earthquake destroyed and lots of people died and this is not just a monument to a destruction but is given birth again to a space through the white and through a creto which I think is one of the less known famous work of art um, in Europe. It's one of those places that I went to and thought, why did I not know that I should have been here before? Italy is hiding the best. Yeah. <laughs> in other way, <clears throat> Uh, Burri uh, imagine and prepare some architecture. I think the uh, Seccatoi del Tabacco is the last work of him because he paints sure. uh, all these buildings in black. Yeah, so, that's so he worked uh, uh, about the form of this building and after it's necessary to don't forget uh, the Grand Decreto di Gibellina is a big, uh, big uh, architecture that cover the ruins Mm. of the old uh, Gibellina that was destroyed by the earthquake in 68, but also the big theater that he built uh, in the Parco Sempione in Milan is a theater for the people, Teatro Continuo. Each people can go and can uh, make theater, dance, is in the street completely. Uh, it's so, and, and now we, we are preparing in Città di Castello we are working from two, three years for build. The last work of him is a very architectural designed and organized by him uh, with the maquette, no? Uh, so we are working for to, to, for, to make the construction, so build. When will that be finished? In Città di Castello. Yeah, but when, finished when? No, finished in 21, 22. Okay. But uh, for example, there is one of the last uh, cycle of work of him is uh, architecture with cactus and so. was exhibited in Atene 
Atene. Sounds good, Ellis. Yes, it does. <laughs> Quite yeah. important what you say, because of course it sounds as Cornelis. And it seems to me that we need, you know, <laughs> the generation me. which followed, you know, Bourri to, the to understand the importance of Bourri. You know, despite of the fact that, as ever, by the way, uh, despite of the fact, as you said to me, that Bourri uh, didn't like, he couldn't like, in a way, you know, Arte Povera. But, uh, well, we need quite a lot of artists, and even in terms of spaces and what you said, you know, uh, from another generation to go back to Bourri and to try to re-articulate something from Bourri. Bourri as a root from, you know, Thank you for that. quite a lot of other artists. Thank you for that, because I always um, try to express the idea that without Bourri, a lot of Roman new generation artists wouldn't exist so strongly uh, because of his materials, but also you know, going towards the, the, the matters, but also going against, you know, kind of a, a, a fadder. Um, think about, there's a series, I think, that is very important in Buri, less known, called Igobbi. Um, which we're going to show uh, <coughs> Venice too, but also think about the Creto. And think about the really early works of Schifano, the monochromes, the, the very, you know, materials one, the black ones, how the color in Buri was in, important. I'm mean, not saying that the Buri was influencing uh, through his way of painting, but Buri was central, as Bernard Blistang is saying, from, for a new generation to grow and, and, and go on. And when you talk about the birth of a certain kind of art in Italy, think about you know, the late works, the er I'm sorry, the very early works of Angeli or the, uh, the early works of dealing with the matière yeah. uh, of all the Italians before Azimut, they all come out yes. from the burlesque. Yes. Um, as a kind, kind of, a, yeah, a, a, a kind of a black mirror of the new, of, of the way of the cosification the, of, of the work. But, but the uh, Arte Povera generation acknowledged and admired Buri, didn't they? Even if he didn't admire them, they admired him, didn't they? Openly. Yes. yes. Yeah. So it's a discernible influence. Yes. More or less, because it seems Bigger to brain. me, yeah, I guess it did, but I've been talking with quite a lot of these artists who, of course, I met, and they didn't really mention Bourri, you know, because they knew that Bourri was definitely the leader and the founder, you know, of what they did, but also, and it brings us back to what we said from the very beginning, from some kind of political reasons, because some of these artists, you know, from Arte Povera, were considered as Marxist, you know, uh, as uh, Mario Merz or even Cunelis at the beginning, so they couldn't accept the they fact. Could, they couldn't even mention it. No, they couldn't the, even, no. Well, because we, there's a kind of, um, again, political matters, but luckily now we, True. We, we're going to go back and see the works. That's, I think, it's very important to have great shows um, to show the, the works of art and then put them in context. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say that Bourri has been blacklisted, as we say, but in a way, a bit. Uh, I've been talking with such an artist as Cunelis, who, of course, you know even more than I did, you know, and, well, he couldn't mention such an artist as Bourri just because of the fact that there was this what we explained at the beginning, this past, and anyway, what he did. And also, maybe I'm wrong, because of the fact that the writers who've been written on Bourri, like Argan, or, you know, uh, Calvesi, or many others, you know, belong to another generation of art critic, to humanist in a way, and um, you know, Meyer Shapiro, well, uh, who's, uh, who's been written on uh, Bourri, and of course, as we know, uh, what has been written later on Arte Povera, you know, and what have been built by Germano Celant and others, you know, they couldn't accept, uh, you know, the writings from this uh, generation and Bourri has been always linked 
to this generation of art critics. It's That's interesting because you mentioned in the fact uh, that finally we can see it with new eyes because orthodoxies are gone, <laughs> mm. uh, like it or not. <laughs> and so I think it's interesting, and that's why we, we are finally, uh, see, this is one of the plastic air hanged in, <coughs> yes. in the space. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that it's very interesting because orthodoxy don't exist anymore in art. So finally we can go back and see Buri in a, in a, in a new light, and it's very interesting. It's actually the power of history. Um, Buri was, uh, I think, uh, very important also for maybe. some artists like uh, Scarpitta, United States, Marcarelli, that was ne very near to the Kooning uh, together, because uh, they say that uh, this man was very strong in the way of uh, ethic of painting, the ethic of painting. And they say for us it was an example uh, behind we can go for to be uh, ar artist very s sincere with the, with the painting, not for to produce one work for to sell or but one work for to there's also for poetic way, yes for to poetic reason there's also something we have to say then um, that since 1954 Buri was very well represented in the United States yes. yes. Uh, and he won the Pittsburgh Prize, and then the Solomon I. Guggenheim Award. I mean, um, there's something that we don't mention here, but um, Buri was influential for new generation in the United States. But then, as we were just mentioning a few uh, an hour ago, uh, something after 1960, and between 1960 and 64, changed the fortune of European artists in the United States. In 1964, it's all another story. Then it's Fautrier and Artung uh, that won the 1960 Biennale, still the France insisting and wanted to stress the idea that Europe was central, but 1964, Rauschenberg. And then the mirror turns and the perspective turns on the other side, but Buri was deeply represented, and James Johnson Sweeney was one of his fans. Um, I think it's, again, with Herbert Reed, but I mean, Sweeney um, literally um, mentioned Buri as one of the best artists uh, of the international post-war and bought three works for the collection in 1954. So um, now we see with the Florensky <laughs> actually perspective, la prospettiva rovesciata, but sí. <laughs> the backwards perspective. But I think that we, ha we actually reestablishing the idea of a more uh, normal perspective, the importance of Buri on the international art world. Well, you, you said that in the mid-60s there kind of was a, a sea change. Um, there's a feeling now, isn't there, that maybe there's a sea change again, and after the big show in uh, the Guggenheim, followed by your show in Venice in the summer, and then, Bernard, your exhibition sometime in the next three years in Paris. Um, maybe it'll prompt this city to um, honour and explore Bury. Although, as I said before, you can see Bury and Fontana's work at Tuonaboni, uh, just around the corner. Um, I think probably um, on a March evening, uh, with a bar beckoning and cocktails from our sponsors, the conversation is probably, as we've done an hour and 10 minutes, is probably better continued in the bar. Okay. Um, so can I thank um, the three of you? Uh, thank, you. No, thank you. No, thank you.